Hello and welcome to the Being and Becoming podcast. Together, we are being honest in conversations about thoughts we're having and books we're reading in the hopes of becoming better, more able versions of our current selves. My name is Logan Hauer. Today, we will be discussing Chapter 9, Assume That the Person You Are Listening To Might Know Something You Don't, from 12 Rules for Life and the Antidote for Chaos by Jordan Peterson. I'm joined today by my two regular hosts, Austin Stone and Patrick Dyer. How are we doing today, guys? Hello, hello. Two thumbs up. Thumbs up. Nice. Some of the topics we'll be discussing today in this chapter include some personal anecdotes from Peterson's life. I think a couple of them are counseling, therapy related. Also talk about Sigmund Freud. There's a Nietzsche reference. We talk, or he talks about uh, childhood or how the past influences us, which then leads into memory. He also discusses thinking and talking. And more importantly, the, li- the listening person. There's a reference about Carl Rogers. Talks then uh, more about therapy and what that relationship looks like between the therapist and the, the patient. He then talks about primate dominance versus good social behavior. He also talks a lot about lectures and the attributes of good lecturers. And then ends on my favorite point of this chapter, mutual exploration. So I just wanted to turn it over to you guys. And I wanted to get your guys' thoughts on advice. Because in the first page of the chapter, I think he almost says this jokingly, but he's really dogging on advice as being the one person is just hoping that the other person would just shut up and go away about their problems. So they're going to offer advice. And at first reading that, I, I thought, okay, hopefully that's a joke. I don't necessarily interpret receiving advice that way or giving advice that way for myself personally but if it came from a close friend obviously I want to hear what they have to say if either of you guys tell me I'm out of line I need to hear that and want to hear that or even if you have a compliment to me like that's that means something to me I want to I want to take that in from you guys but then he also talks about advice being one person trying to enjoy having superiority over another person because they're more intelligent than them and so then they're relaying advice i see that more as if it were to be true maybe uh an older person giving a younger person advice saying oh i've been through that and like i've learned and let me share that with you but i don't know i i guess do you guys agree with with those with those statements. This is where I want to tap. This is where I would want to tap into Patrick's knowledge of Proverbs. And I would oh, love shoot. to see <laughs> your perspective, what you think Proverbs is trying to talk about, trying to say about advice and how that might relate or contrast with what Peterson is saying here. To start, I suppose, personally, don't completely disagree. There's definitely some instances I can think of where this would be true, and then many I would think of where it's not. Relating to Proverbs, Solomon suggests actually seeking advice from many counselors, but if you have a good relationship with the counselor. So the dynamic you have with who you're getting from the, the advice from may be the most important factor, if not the most important, a very crucial one. It's kind of funny. I just gave advice recently to someone at the hospital because there was – this guy working at the kitchen who wants to enter one of the floors at the unit tech. And I don't know if maybe this is, I'm assuming advice would be the right word, but I told him what he should do because I understand you have to make the connection to get hired on the floor, especially when you're switching from working in the kitchen to then coming to the floor and working. I I wasn't telling him that to make him shut up and go away. And I wasn't developing, I don't think I was showing superiority with that either. So that's, that's, one reason why I disagree, but I also agree from this side too, because many people have tried to give me advice and I've seen them give other people advice. And if they keep talking, then they're trying to be superior, hoping you would shut up and go away. If they actually ask you questions and try to delve into your mind and thought process, then they probably are being genuine. So that's a little distinction. Pat, that's such an important component with 
maybe advice could be seen as I'm not asking for something, but someone is just telling, yeah. talking at you. <laughs> yes. They're telling you something. Maybe that's the way Peterson views it more. Because the situation with your friend that you were laying out, that to me seems like a genuine conversation where he's coming to you, asking you something, trusting your opinion, ah. and then you're able to then share that information. So the phrase you said then would make Jordan say, well, that, I wasn't giving advice. I was being in a... I was being psychotherapeutic with him because you said genuine conversation and he made, he makes the distinction between psychotherapy is not advice nor is advice like psycho, psychotherapy. It's in fact a genuine conversation. So maybe, maybe we don't understand what advice is. Oh, okay. But I also have noticed something else that people aren't going to give advice that they wouldn't have given their former self, Ooh! which which makes it really, really fragile. Say that one more time, Patrick, please. Ah, crap. Let's see if I can repeat it. <laughs> People wouldn't give advice that they wouldn't have given their former self. So when people are giving advice, they're not really caring about you too much. They're trying to deflect what they wish they would have done in the if their situation relates, which may or may not be good advice it might be bad advice but it's just not that valuable if it's not coming from a good relationship i suppose but advice becomes a genuine conversation when that person's coming to the other person wanting to know about their past experience so that they can glean something from it that way yeah they're sure. already there yeah. inserting themselves waiting for you know them to learn about that other person's past experience and maybe it's just pulling hairs, but yeah, I, I still don't fully agree with what he thinks advice is, but maybe I just don't understand what true advice is. I was about to say, I think we maybe have a different understanding of advice than what he does. Yeah, that's true. Also, he's a lot older than us too, so maybe he's received but, a lot of bad advice through But the like years. Austin was saying earlier, and you too, Logan, like I, I've gotten, I've received so much advice from you both over the years, and I have never felt once like you guys were doing it in a superiority complex type of way. So, it's, uh, but maybe that's because it was a genuine conversation, which isn't advice. I don't know. Relationship. <laughs> this is so well, interesting to me in because I, I feel like at the beginning of this chapter, Peterson embodies a pessimism that he in other places critiques. He critiques people who are nihilistic, who think that everything's meaningless and then kind of come to this place where they think that, all the relationships in the world are just power struggles, you know? And he kind of shows, his view of advice kind of shows he thinks that the world is a place of power struggles where it's just it's just this doggy dog world where if you're coming to get advice, it's just me, you know, serving myself and just talking to you and not trying to help you. So his critique of advice is just, I think, very interesting because it reveals kind of a nihilistic view of the world. And maybe he does think that because of the nihilism in the world, people view this way about advice, and now people just love to give advice without caring about the person that they're talking to. Interesting observation, Austin. Because I actually felt like it was consistent with him viewing other people, or their motivations, I guess you could say. I think he questions the motivations of other people As when they're trying to do good or good work. Yeah, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Having that discernment. I will say that's definitely Same. something I'm not good at. I'm a highly open person. I'm not good at perceiving necessarily all the time when a person isn't good or, or what a situation isn't good for me. I'm not always great at recognizing that. But I will say that there's another chapter where he talks about when you go to help someone, check your own motives to make sure you're not doing it for your own self or your own gain. So I, I almost feel like this is an echo of that. and But in this time, it's not helping someone, it's giving someone advice. Like, not helping them physically, but maybe helping them verbally. So keeping yourself in check. And now this, let's keep in mind as well that this is the setup for the story that we previously just talked about and that will lead to the rest of the book. He's trying, I guess, emphasizing the importance of how critical the idea that psychotherapy is genuine conversation i don't want to go too far back 
but... No, I like the line where he says, it's amazing what people will tell you if you listen. Yeah, and then he further says, like, people will actually start to solve their own problems the more you listen. It's like they know what they should do. It just hasn't been concretely verbalized. I'm an external processor, so this is huge for me. I'm I'm very much this way where I know what the problem is in my head, but I can get two in my head. If I could just talk to Austin and Pat about what That's I what need to saying. do, then I can do the thing. That's what he's saying. I'm also very much of an external <laughs> processor, but I'm learning the superpowers of the introvert. And Peterson talks about thinking, and I would love if we could maybe work together to try to summarize and understand what he's talking about when he talks about thinking and how they're little avatars in your head. Like if you're able to think well, you're able to think of future versions of yourself yeah. doing something and then comparing it to other future versions of yourself doing something. And then you try to pick the best avatar of the future version of yourself doing something. And then that's kind of what thinking is. And that's what deciding something is. Can you guys help complement my summary of that idea he presents this isn't a compliment but i remember from a few psychology classes i've taken that's a measure of iq what you just described the higher iq someone has generally they can keep track of all of those different quote-unquote avatars sift them through and make the a decision wow so higher iq people have an easier time with that than average or below that would make sense though, right? I think because if you're taking the time to be introspective and learning about yourself, that would communicate some kind of intelligence, I would, I would imagine. And being able to put these avatars through all these different mazes and like if one dies, let them die. Yeah. But they don't yeah. like to die. I thought that whole thing was really interesting. It's better for an idea to die than you. But sometimes... Ideas become yes. such a meaningful purpose in someone's life. Like for us, following Jesus, I can't think of a modern example where you would die to follow Jesus, but it happens in other places where they're willing to die for their devotion. It's more than an idea at that point because be Christians believe that oh, our well religion said. is our relationship with the creator. So it's more than just an idea at that point. But uh, atheists would say, oh, those Christians are willing to uh, die for their idea and not let the idea die so that they can keep living. Right, right. Yeah, I thought the avatar thing, I had never thought about it that way, but I think I, I kind of do that myself. Thinking about, okay, if I climb this building, what's gonna happen if I fall or if, what I, you know, things like that where you kind of have to think through before you do something, okay, what are the potential results? And that's kind of a, maybe a more childish example but i think if you're married you sometimes have to think okay if i say this what will that do if i do this what will that cause on this other person that i'm very intimately like involved with how do my actions impact this person but then yeah also just making your own life decisions as well i think that that's very relevant people need to think and this is where i want to quote peterson here because this is think. so fascinating to me he says what are you to do then if you aren't very good at thinking? At being two people at one time. That's easy. You talk. I think we kind of know people. I think everyone kind of knows someone in their life who has who isn't just that good at thinking. So they just externalize everything. And I'm probably that person for someone in my life. But you, you, you have trouble thinking so you just talk. You just talk all the time. And, and, and this can even describe someone with like a psychosis like who, yeah. who who has trouble thinking so they just say everything in their brain and and then people stop listening to them so they just talk and they become gibberish but that's besides my point i just think that's such an interesting thing where if you're not good at thinking then you talk and that brings to something that logan really resonated with at the end of the chapter which was where's this balance of you do need to be able to think in your head but we have to have other people in our life to balance out our thinking and we need to be in community because not one individual can do all the right thinking by themselves. Right, yeah. I like the idea that you're communicating there, Austin, with thinking is listening to yourself too because you don't want to just be talking all the, all the time to, to everybody. But 
you do need to at times to be two people at the same time, like almost within your own head and let those people disagree and just talk. I thought that that was fascinating because you don't want to just articulate everything all the time to everybody. But yeah, there needs to be an internal dialogue going on as well. And I think at different phases of my life, I, I've definitely been that person where I'm talking too much, especially if I've just found a great idea or something I love. I'm always talking about yeah. it. <laughs> I'm like, I know I'm annoying you, but... <laughs> and then I continue talking about it. Yeah, I think what he talks about true thinking, being complex and demanding, you need to be articulate and also you need to be a great listener. That stuff really resonated with me because I know I'm guilty at times of not being a great listener. And that means I can't possibly be doing my best thinking if I'm not listening well. This brings me to my favorite part of this chapter when he's asking, why is it so hard to be a good listener? You know, And if I can map that question onto the political divide in America, why is it so hard for liberals to listen to conservatives? Why is it so hard for conservatives to listen to liberals? And this is where Peterson quotes Carl Rogers, a famous clinical psychologist, psychoanalyst, and he's kind of talking about listening. Uh, do you mind if I kind of run through this quote and then I can hear your thoughts? Please do. This is a longer one, so I'm going to see what do. I can read and yeah. what I can summarize. But So he's talking about listening here, and he says, Listening sounds simple, right? Doesn't it? But if you try it, you will discover it is one of the most difficult things you have ever tried to do. If you really understand a person in this way, if you're willing to enter his private world and see the way life appears to him, you can run the risk of being changed yourself. You might see it his way. You might find yourself influenced in your attitudes or personality. The risk of being changed is one of the most frightening prospects most of us can face. So I was like, whoa, I've never seen listening as a dangerous thing. Wow. But to map this politically, just for a second, it is dangerous for a liberal to listen to a conservative. It is dangerous for a conservative to listen to a liberal because that will threaten their preconceived ideas. And that's why I want to say, how can we somehow come together and see the humanity in each other so that we can complement the weaknesses of our views? Phenomenal. Crazy. Wow. Whew. I'm glad you read that. I wish there was an easy solution to that question, but I do think that the listening component is so huge and not settling with your conventional wisdom of your ideas, but being open that wisdom is the pursuit of knowledge. It's not wisdom isn't the knowledge you currently have. It's that pursuit. And he ends the chapter talking about Socrates and that that sort of idea where Socrates wasn't necessarily flattered with what he knew. He was amazed by what he didn't know or what he still had to learn. Yeah, I think that if we could follow in that suit or in that way and just be open to to acting in good faith, listening to other people and their perspectives, I think that that would be revolutionary. I need a replay of that. I need a replay of what you just said, Logan, because I think the ruling on this field will still stand, but I need you to say that again about wisdom. Yeah, so he talks about wisdom, and this is totally him, not my idea, but he talks about wisdom at the end being the pursuit of knowledge and not what you currently know. It's not your current knowledge, but it's the pursuit of what you still have to learn. And that's why Socrates was respected by the Greek. There was a Greek, I can't remember what the position was, but it was basically like the ruler or religious authority really respected him because they recognized that this man was so smart, but he wasn't wise because he was smart. Yeah. He was wise because he knew he knew nothing and was trying to Constantly learn. Constantly asking questions. Yeah, yeah, that really resonates with me. And I really like the Carl Rogers quote that you shared. I'm not sure if I had ever really heard of him before this chapter, but I also wrote down a quote that I wanted to share, probably from the same kind of area, but... I think this is the Rogerian method or something in psychology I, he kind of alludes to. Yeah, I'll just read the quote. I routinely summarize what people have said to me and ask them if I have understood properly. Sometimes they accept my summary. Sometimes I'm offered a small correction. Now and then I'm completely wrong. Yes. All of that is good to know. Wow. Wow. 
I love that. Rogers was talking about when you're misunderstanding someone and it's starting to get kind of heated, almost like a, not a debate, but a disagreement to just kind of stop, collect yourself and then do that. Summarize what the person said. Did I understand you correctly? And then they'll let you know if they did or they'll make a correction or they'll just say you didn't understand me at all. Either way, any of those three options, you need to know that. Yeah, yeah, such a good description of a healthy friendship, such a good description of a healthy individual who's willing to and to do that. And it's it's the antidote to constructing straw man arguments of other people's positions. Because if you're at, if you're listening and you're asking follow-up questions about did I understand you correctly, you can't construct this false image of what they're trying to say because you're coming to a closer understanding of what they're actually saying. Yeah, there are bad actors who will pretend that they're doing that, but they're not. There's, so you're saying that blah, 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 and they kind of fill in their misunderstanding of how they see that person. Yeah, if it's a bad summary over and over, you know they're being intentional. Right, right. Thank you. And maybe you just need to end the conversation or have some wisdom about how to move forward if that person is going to not, not understand what you're saying. If you can't explain it any other way, maybe you just need to walk yeah. away for a second. Or Ooh, There's advice from Logan, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll pretend like I know, know something. And this is where um, Peterson, near the end of the chapter, I appreciate he, him mentioning something about community. And here's a quote from him. He says, the input of the community is required for the integrity of the individual psyche. So it just shows the need that we have for each other. I thought that those interesting, uh, regarding community, those points he's making at the end, where he talks about do what other people are doing unless you have a good reason not to. Because normally the old trope of the mother-son conversation is, well, if all your friends are jumping off a bridge, right. would you? And you know, it, It's funny because it's not antithetical to that advice because obviously you need to use your own wisdom and discernment to process, but... He is kind of saying, like, if this is working for everyone else, do it. Unless there's a specific reason why you shouldn't do it. I don't know. I thought that was thought that was funny. But it, it just struck me uh, comically because of thinking of that old example, yeah. the old trope of the don't do what other people are doing. But obviously, it's, it's not the same. There's, there's discernment there. But no one would have the right mental capacity to be able to think about every single thing that everybody does and see if it's the right or wrong thing to do like we come to the point where we have to end up doing something that we see everyone else doing in our lives yeah hey we have respected the personal experience of our conversational partners here today i believe and if it's all right with you guys i did want to touch on the last part of the chapter where he's talking about mutual exploration that's the heart of this podcast and a lot of just our friendship. And it's worth noting, he talks about different kinds of conversation in those relationships. So he talks about lectures and how those are actually conversations. He talks about therapy, which we've kind of talked about. But then he also talks about dominance, primate dominance. It's basically bad conversations where there's just one person trying to talk over the other, not much thinking involved. That's like a political debate right there. <laughs> right. Your motives aren't pure, but I thought that that was kind of funny. He would touch on primate dominance kind of conversations where you feel like you need to win. You need to roll over the other points of view and you're not actually listening to what they're saying. And maybe if you did listen, that could inform your own perspective better, or at least it could help you understand their position. But then, yes, yeah, so then we land on mutual exploration that is where there's a true reciprocity between both listener and speaker all participants can express and organize their thoughts you can't have a conversation of mutual exploration without mutual respect being able to see the dignity of the mm. human being that you're you're speaking to i think that's logan you summed that up so well i think that is a goal of our relationship our friendship here and the goal of our podcast. And I, 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 I love how we ended the chapter like that. And that's a good way to 
to wrap up here. Pat, did you have any any thoughts on the mutual exploration? It might relate. It's just a, one of the last quotes on 255. I just really liked it. He said, a conversation like that places you in the same place that listening to great music places you, and for the same reason. It's in a realm where souls connect, and that's a real place. Whoa! Yeah. I wrote that down, too. I love that. That's wild to think about. I also liked, a little bit before that, he's talking about meditating versus strategy. With these conversations of mutual exploration, you're not trying to strategize how to win your point over. You need to meditate and think about what what is this person saying to me? What am I thinking based on what they've said? How am I going to articulate exactly. that? And yeah, I this whole section for me was like, yes, 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 yes. Respond to new information from the speaker. Report what that information does for you. What new things appear within you? How does it change your presuppositions and create new questions? And I wrote below that this is our high school friend group. Yeah. So I think that's a great note to end on, though. Let's desire to seek the truth, respect each other while we're doing it, and hopefully have some good, honest conversations while we're all exploring this wonderful world of ideas and meaning. Beautiful. Right on. Thank you for tuning in to this week's book club discussion. Please let us know if you have any suggestions as to books we should read or topics we should discuss by contacting us at beingbecomingpodcast at gmail.com. Again, that's beingbecomingpodcast at gmail.com. We hope you join us next week for another engaging conversation.